Welcome everyone to our closing keynote session. My name is Tracy Morton. I'm the Director of Population Health at the National Rural Health Resource Center and I'm the Program Manager for TASC. Thanks so much for sticking with us through the three days of the reverse side visit. I'm really excited to close out the session with what we have to share with you about leadership. A little bit about the space that we're in if this is your first time joining this space. Um, we're happy to help you out as best as we can so there will be technical support available. If you do need that support, you can call a number that's 1-833-987 3703, or you can email to RHRC support at cvent.com. This session is being recorded and the playback will be available for you in the attendee hub shortly after the session concludes. I think I'm going to want to go back and listen to this, so I hope that you access that recording later on and kind of learn from it more as you go. Uh, we do encourage you to use the chat feature during this session. We're looking for an interactive session. I'll tell you a little bit more of that, about that as we go along. You can find the chat in the upper right-hand corner of your screen. If, screen. if you click on that and then click join chat, you'll be entered into that space and we'll be able to engage with one another together there. So this session is about choosing uplifting leadership and it's going to be a highly interactive session with our speaker, Dennis Wagner. And Dennis will be sharing with us some key leadership mindsets and methods that we can use to grow our capabilities as leaders in rural healthcare in our organizations, communities, and our families. Um, we hope that you come to this session prepared to learn, to engage as we ask questions, and you might have questions for Dennis as well, and to interact and try on the use of powerful and uplifting leadership mindsets and methods. We hope that you gain insights into portable and practical actions and ways that, of being that can increase your effectiveness as leaders and introduce greater joy into your work and into your lives. So a little bit more about our closing keynote speaker. Uh, Dennis Wagner is an enthusiastic and thoughtful strategic leader and a senior executive who believes in committing to and delivering on bold goals in work and in life. Dennis is nationally and internationally recognized as a leader in quality improvement, hospital patient safety, organ donation and transplantation, large scale change, and the environment. He served the public and the United States government for 33 years at the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency, the Health Resources and Services Administration, and the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services. Dennis and the teams that he's led have delivered on some bold goals. And those include goals to the large public and private sector communities of practice in achieving unprecedented improvements and results. They've increased access to higher quality healthcare for underserved and vulnerable people. They've had dramatic and lasting national increases in life-saving and life-enhancing organ transplants. Cleaner indoor air and improved health for millions of the poorest families in the planet have resulted um, because of improved cook stoves. And there's been improvements in national um, access and hospital patient safety. Dennis has also delivered on some impact because of outcomes that have resulted in these goals as we've been talking about throughout this reverse site visit. Through his work and with the team that he led side by side, They've improved the safety of all U.S. hospitals that resulted in an estimated 1.2 million fewer harms to patients, $19.8 billion in cost savings, and 87,000 lives saved. Dennis is currently the Principal and Managing Director of Yes and Leadership, LLC. He just concluded service as a Congressionally Chartered National Academy of Sciences Engineering and Medicine Committee member, where he conducted a comprehensive 16-month review of the nation's organ donation and transplantation system. Dennis grew up in rural Montana near Baker, and he attended Fertile Prairie, a one-room country school for grades K through eight. He received his BA and his MPA degrees from Montana State University, and he's married to Diane Hill, formerly of Rainsburg, Montana. They live in Alexandria, Virginia with their three children. Dennis, welcome. Thank you so much for being here, and I am very excited about what you have to share with us. Well, thank you for that very kind, uh, if somewhat long, <laughs> introduction, Tracy. I, I really appreciate it. And I'm just absolutely delighted to have the opportunity to be with you, Tracy, um, and with other members of your team, Matt, Caroline, Sally, and, and others at the National Rural Resource Center. It's been a pleasure getting to know you and, and to work with you leading up to today's session. Um, I wanna begin um, now by by thanking the, um, I see we have 80 people uh, in the session. I wanna thank you for the hard work, resourcefulness, and service that you've shown, especially over the course of the last couple of years with the, the COVID pandemic. The rural providers that I know you support in the field have had very, very challenging times in 
in supporting their communities and supporting their patients. Not just the usual problems of, of payment and so on, but nurse shortages, staff shortages, um, issues with community members around things like mask wearing and vaccination. So I know it's it's tough, right? Uh, but I want to thank you for, for what you're doing and especially for the leadership and the teaming that you're doing with HRSA. I love HRSA. I worked at HRSA for 12 years. Uh, I consider Tom Morris a very good friend and have many other friends in the office of Federal Office of Rural Health Policy there at HRSA. Uh, but I want to thank you for teaming with them, with the R Rural Resource Center and, and with each other. Um, this is great work you're doing and it's much needed. And I care deeply about rural America. Um, Tracy mentioned, you know, in my bio, I am from rural Montana, a very rural part of Montana, kind of right where North Dakota, South Dakota and Montana come together. These are a couple of photos, very dated back when I still had hair and the hair that I had was, wasn't was gray. <laughs> um, but you see on the left, that's me. I was nine years old showing my first 4-H steer at the Fallon County Fair. Uh, later, uh, as a senior in high school, you see a picture there on the right, I was the first vice president, the state first vice president of the Montana Future Farmers of America and got to go to Washington, D.C. for the first time and uh, met with uh, then Secretary of Agriculture, Bob Berglund. So my roots, uh, my rural roots go very, very deep, but also my roots with rural health care. My mom, was a certified uh, nurse assistant at the Fallon Memorial Hospital there in Baker and worked there for 35 years. So I kind of grew up um, meeting mom, you know, taking mom to the nursing home and the hospital and supporting the patients there uh, at Fallon Memorial. So I care very deeply about the work that you're doing. Now, the questions that we're going to run on, and I'm going to focus on sharing with you my answers to these first two questions that you see here. Um, but your answers, particularly to the third question, are really what this is all about. And you heard Tracy say that we're planning for a, uh, an interactive session. So every so often, about every 10 or 15 minutes, I'm going to pause and I'm going to give you a couple of questions. And I'd like you to think about those questions, develop a quick answer. If you're with someone, you know, uh, discuss with them your answer. If you're alone, as I think many of you probably are, um, make a note, but then share your answers in the chat. Um, so we're gonna we're gonna do that like three times, and and Tracy together with Matt are gonna help with that. So the first question: What can each of us do to become more effective, but also experience greater joy in this difficult and challenging times that we live in? What are some of the leadership principles and mindsets that can help us to thrive and work in life? And I'm gonna share four of those with you. And then the question for you, how might we apply these to the work that you're doing with rural providers and caregivers throughout the states that you serve? Those are the questions that we're gonna run on and I'll work to answer or share my best answers with on the first two with you, but it's really your own answers that are gonna make all the difference when you apply them to the work that you're doing. Now, as we head into the session, I have a request. I'll have several requests actually as we go along here. My first one is that you be a certain way that you be a certain way. And you see on the slide the way that I'm inviting you, or requesting that you be together with me and with each other for this session. Present, open, and collaborative, engaged. This is all teach, all learn. Um, my background is deeply steeped in quality improvement. And you know more than anyone about the questions and the work that we're working on. So sharing those in the chat, and we'll call out a few of those answers. Uh, Matt and Tracy will help with that. Trying on the principles and methods that we're going to discuss and active in processing these key questions. Now, just to get us going, to kind of limber up, and you heard Tracy just a moment or two ago, talked about how to use the chat. And I would like everyone, all 80 people that are on this session to just very quickly uh, try it out, use the chat and share a word or a phrase in the chat that describes a way of being that you aspire to in your own work and life. And I'll just say, I think it was part of my bio actually, um, three of the ways that I seek to be um, most of the time, I seek to be thoughtful, I seek to be strategic, and I don't have to try very hard, but <laughs> I, I seek to be enthusiastic. Um, so I, I, I want to just invite you, like, what are your ways of being? What are the ways that you aspire to be as part of your work in your life? And share your answers in the chat. And Tracy or Matt, if you see some things in the chat um, um, sure. that I'm not seeing because I'm focused on presenting and have a different view, uh, feel free to jump in, voice of God, interrupt me, cut in and, and share a couple of those answers, right? So Absolutely. Um, so we got a lot of respectful, Dennis. Um, and moral, resourceful, positive, servant heart, compassionate, mm -hmm. empathetic, excited. Someone said everything that was said by everyone else, helpful, intentional, approachable. Oh, that's great. 
Fantastic. Thank you. So I want to thank everybody for jumping in and doing that. Don't hesitate. You know, if you have questions as we go along or answers you want to share, put them in the chat and we'll just hear them as, as we charge forward. So over the course of my 30 years or more, I guess, actually in the federal government, um, um, I was a student and a practitioner of leadership. I felt that in most of the work that I did in leading change, usually uh, in leading change nationally, that leadership was almost more important than the technical content, you know, the quality improvement methods or, 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 or many other aspects of the work that I was doing. And so I collected these leadership mindsets and methods and then tried to use them in my own life and in my own work with my family, with my teams, the organizations that I led with my customers, with the vendors that I teamed with. And you see here a list of 25 of these leadership mindsets and methods with kind of a very short you know, term or descriptor that doesn't mean a lot. But there are four of them highlighted in blue that are to be the focus of four methods I'm going to share with you over the course of the next 50 minutes or so. Choice. Abundance, how to generate abundance in our work and our lives, net forward energy, creating positive energy for ourselves and others, and then real work. Like, what's real work? Like, what's that about, right? Those are the four. We won't have time to do the other 21, but maybe that'll be next year. You know, we'll, we'll see how things go here. And I want to say right at the beginning that these leadership mindsets and methods are effective. And they're not only effective, they bring joy. They, they can bring joy to yourself and to the people that are part of the teams that you're working with. Um, what you see here is one example. Um, in a way, my whole career has been a series of run charts, and this is one of the run charts. Um, I led national work from 2003 to 2007 to generate significant increases in organ donation nationally. Uh, it was a huge priority of then Secretary Tommy Thompson, who came from Wisconsin and was determined to see the numbers go up. And I was accountable for leading the major initiative to generate increases. And what you see here are the number of organ donors per month in the United States. And you see from 1999 through about 2003, it's pretty flat, um, right around 500, 525 donors per month, um, kind of year in and year out. And then we implemented a large national initiative, and it was grounded in the four methods that I'm going to share with you today and some of those other ones that made all the difference in the world. And you can see that over the four-year period following that, 2003 through 2007, we generated major month-over-month -month increases in organ donation throughout the United States. Um, and I could show five other rum charts, but we don't have time for that. The, um, but these methods work um, and, and they, they, they help to increase the joy and work as well. I'm gonna start with the first that I think is the single most powerful method of all 25. This is something, oh, and I should say this, when, when you look at those 25 methods, they're things you already know. Um, and I'm gonna be bringing things up that you know, right? Calling them to the front of your brain and maybe giving you a slightly more structured way of applying them to your work. So this first very powerful method, stimulus and response, like this is the basis of science, particularly social, social science, you know, where we apply a particular stimulus, we see what happens, we look at what the response is and whatever it is that we're studying. And by repeating that experiment in different ways over time, we can predict the future, like right? we can predict the responses. Um, I worked as a senior executive at CMS for 10 years. And one of the things that we do every year, and you all are part of this work, is we change payment. Right. And we change payment because we're trying to reduce costs and improve quality or improve health outcomes. Um, so we're constantly applying different stimulus to payment and seeking new responses that are higher quality care and lower cost care. Um, so it's a very powerful model. But this there is an even more powerful model. And the even more powerful model looks like this, that certain stimulus occur in the world. And then as human beings with conscious intent we can choose how to respond. And that choice makes all the difference in the world. I first learned about this from Stephen Covey, the celebrated author of The Seven Habits of Highly Effective People and a whole slew of other books. Uh, and I got to know Dr. Covey quite well, actually. And in each of his books, he always leads with this model. Um, and Dr. Covey would say that when we get intentional about choices, no matter what the stimulus is, when we get intentional about choices, it's like working out in the gym, that we exercise the muscles of humanity. And this is important because a lot of the stimulus that hit us every day in our work and in our lives are negative things or things that we might see as bad things that we might perceive in that way. And when those bad things happen to us or to our teams, our choices just make all the difference in the world. 
We can take bad things like insults and not insult back. We can take things like complaints. And instead of being angry or frustrated, we can turn the complaints into improvement. These are choices that we get to make as the world acts on us. And leadership is all about holding ourselves personally accountable for those choices in that space and exercising those muscles of humanness. When good things happen, like acknowledgements or people generate great results, maybe in the hospitals that we're supporting or serving and the states that we're in, we can amplify those good things. We can call attention to them. We can celebrate them. Um, so it, it really, leadership turns on our choices and our responses. And there are all sorts of dimensions where we get to make these choices every single day, all day long. What we think, what we say, and what we spread to others. These are leadership choices. I'll give you a personal example. A lot of the times in the mornings when I wake up, one of the first thoughts that fills my head is all the things I didn't get done the day before, all the things I need to get done this day, and things that maybe I didn't do as well as I'd hoped to. And I will worry. Worry is kind of a, a natural reaction for me when I wake up in the morning. And I've learned over time that I have control over that, that I have control over what I think. And now when I wake up in the morning and that worry hits me, um, I shift and I say, what am I grateful for? And I'll spend five minutes just making lists in my mind of the things that I'm grateful for in life. And it changes everything. It makes all the difference in the world. So we have a lot of control over what we think and certainly over what we say and what we spread to others. And that's really where leadership occurs. This is, in my experience, the most powerful model. Now, Dr. Covey didn't come up with this. Um, the, the originator of it, who he quotes in many of his books, is the gentleman you see pictured here, Viktor Frankl. Viktor Frankl was a psychiatrist. Uh, he headed the psychiatry department in the largest hospital in Vienna, Austria, when the Nazis rolled in. He was a Jew, Viktor Frankl was, as were all of his family members. They were imprisoned in Nazi concentration camps. His young wife was in prison and died. His mother and father were both in prison and they both died. His brother was in prison and he died. His sister, like Frankel, survived. And Frankel developed this very simple, straightforward model of stimulus choice and response based on his time in Nazi concentration camps, where in the worst possible conditions you can imagine, he recognized he had choices. And two of the choices that he made every single day was system and method. One choice was to show compassion for other fellow prisoners, to care about what was happening to them and how they felt, and to do that constantly. The other choice was to imagine that one day he might actually be free, that this might end, and that he might be free. And he eventually was freed. He survived. And he wrote this seminal book, Man's Search for Meaning, which I strongly recommend if you haven't read it. And you can see the quote here. I'm going to read this. Between stimulus and response, there is a space. And in that space is our power to choose our response. And in our response lies our growth and our freedom. I think this is the single most powerful leadership model I have ever encountered. And it makes all the difference in my life and in my work. I'm going to give you an example, one quick working example of what this looks like in practice. You see pictured here, um, Michelle, excuse me, you see pictured here, Bob and Barb Melizo on the far right with their daughter. Uh, Christina and Christina's son, and they're standing at the gravesite of their other daughter. Bob and Barb Melizo made some extraordinary choices. I'm going to share a little bit about them. Um, this is about turning tragedy into something good for other people. Um, their daughter, Michelle, had to have liver surgery for a relatively minor liver operation. She was having a, a clogged bile duct, and they had to, had to operate at the University of Illinois Medical Center in 2008. They gave her three times the appropriate amount of anesthesia, a medical error, and she died on the operating table. Now, that particular hospital at the time was implementing a program that HRQ, the Agency for Healthcare Research and Quality, had developed called CANDOR. And what they had pledged to do in implementing CANDOR in their hospital is if they made a medical error, that they would, one, admit it, two, they would apologize for it. I just saw my mic off light came up, but now it's back. So I'm going to continue. That hospital implemented that and it made a lot of difference for Bob and Barb. And after recovering from the tragedy of their daughter's death, they're as best as any parent could. They set themselves to helping the University of Illinois Medical Center, improving their safety record. 
and they teamed with ARC about spreading candor nationally. I learned about them in 2011 when they came to a meeting that I was leading at CMS to improve hospital sa patient safety. They joined our initiative and we sent them all over the United States of America at state hospital associations and other gatherings of hospital leaders to talk about the importance of improving safety based on their own experience with their daughter, Michelle. Dennis, would you yes. mind repeating those strategies right quick? When you cut out, uh, one part was missed. Um, which strategies, Matt? I, I don't know exactly when I cut out. Um, it was uh, shortly after you talked about the hospital was implementing some strategies. Very good. Thank you. Um, so the hospital where their daughter died on the operating table was implementing a strategy called CANDOR. And CANDOR is a, a protocol that was developed by the Agency for Healthcare Research and Quality that when a hospital makes a medical error, they do three things. One, they admit it. Two, they apologize for the error. And three, they offer compensation. That's what happened to them at the University of Illinois Medical Center when their daughter died. And they teamed up with that medical center to improve safety at the University of Illinois Medical Center. They worked with ARC to spread the candor method. And that's how I met them when I was leading the Partnership for Patients Initiative to improve hospital sa safety nationally. We sent these people all over the United States and they shared the story of the loss of their daughter, how the hospital handled it and what they were doing to become ambassadors for trying to improve safety in the United States. They were a huge part of our effort. These are the results. Um, what you see here is the number of harms per thousand discharges in all U.S. hospitals. Our baseline when we started this work in 2010 was 145 harms per thousand discharges. And you can see that through 2017, um, the, the rate of harms per thousand discharges has been cut almost in half to 86 harms per thousand discharges. Now we've still got a long way to go, but this is major dramatic progress. Um, at the beginning of this session, I think Tracy mentioned that myself and, and two of my colleagues were honored as Federal Employees of the Year in 2016. It's a big ceremony in downtown Washington and trophies were handed out. It was, it was really an amazing thing and probably the highlight of my career. We got to invite two people to that event and the two that we chose to invite were Bob and Barb Malizzo for their contribution. Now this is what it means to have bad things happen and to turn some of that bad into good. Um, and if they can do it, and if Victor Frankel can do it, we can do it in our work. And that really is, is what choice is all about. I want to pause for the first time. Um, I'm going to do this slide, and then I'm going to give you a couple of questions that I'd like you to share your answers in the chat. So get ready. Um, and we'll, we'll hear a few of those from Matt or from Tracy. I would observe that leadership, unlike management, is not something you can delegate. You can delegate someone to become a manager, but leadership is a choice that we make. What we think, what our aims are, what we say, and what we spread to others. And it's something that we can do at every level of the organization, whether we're the CEO or the director, whether we're a manager or not a manager. I have met people who were janitors or receptionists that were extraordinary leaders, and you can see it. They, they, they leaned in on the choices and they, they, they excelled in their work and they made choices to, to do things for people that, that were better. Um, and that's, that's at the heart of leadership. Now, one of my mentors is this extraordinary woman here. She was a senior executive at HRSA. She was the deputy director of the Bureau of Primary Health Care when I met her. She was my boss for a period of four years, a pharmacist, the first woman to serve on the board of the American Pharmacists Association, but she was also a poet. I'm going to read the first paragraph about how she describes leadership consistent with Frankel's model. Leaders are called to stand in that lonely place between the no longer and the not yet and intentionally make choices that will bind, forge, move, and create history. That's the essence of choice. That's the essence of leadership. Um, she was an extraordinary person. Um, she passed away about five years ago, but has living on in many, many people's lives today as a result of the choices that she, that she made. So our two questions. And again, if you're with someone, take a minute and discuss your answers. If you're alone, make a note and share in the chat. What is a key leadership choice that made an important difference in my professional life or my personal life? So share one of yours, or if you prefer, what resonates with me the most about choice as a powerful principle and method for impacting work and life? Now I'm gonna turn um, to Tracy or Matt, I'm not sure who will respond here, to see if, if you have some responses that you can share with us. 
Thanks, Dennis. This is Tracy. And as we're waiting for some responses that come into the chat, we did ask a couple people early about some of these questions too. So Nicole Breton is the director for rural health and primary care in the state of Maine. And she shared that one of the critical leadership choices that's made an important difference in her life is to have empathy as well as strength. She says it's helped her with communication in her professional and personal life by being an effective leader and also kind at the same time. Mm -hmm. And people know that she's approachable and has an open door policy. Outstanding. That was Nicole Breton, did you say? Yes, Tracy? in Maine, yeah. Excellent, that's beautiful. Thank you. And do you have a second one as well? I do. Yeah. Yep. Um, so we talked to John Barnes too, who is the executive director for the Michigan Center for Rural Health. And he said that somewhere around 1990 or 1991, he went to see Lou Holt speak in Battle Creek, Michigan. And at that time, he was the head um, football coach at the University of Notre Dame. And they were having this tremendous success that those years in the program. And he spent a great deal of time talking about his life, successes, challenges, and failures as well as motivation and relationships, both professional and personal. And at some point he said this, do your best, do what's right and treat others fairly. And John said that that statement has stuck to him like glue and it's his compass, his level, and he uses it every day and he's added to it to keep a sense of humor. Excellent. Those are beautiful guideposts for, guideposts for making choices, right? Do your best, do what's right. Like, I love that. Uh, and that was John Barnett from Michigan. Is that right? John Barnett from Michigan. Yep. Excellent. Matt, do you have some others from the chat? I certainly do. Yeah. Dennis, um, we've had a few. We had uh, Kathleen said, lead from where you stand. Um, a key leadership choice. Uh, Liz uh, from Utah said that uh, to see others as team members, not as subordinates, and that I am not better than anyone else just because I am a manager. Um, Very very consistent with this idea that that leadership occurs at all levels, right? That it's not exactly. just imbued in managers. That is very well said. Yeah. Others? Yeah. Yeah. And uh, yeah, um, this one's real simple, but it's uh, pretty positive and always assume positive intent. Mm -hmm. that's, a, that's a really great one. That's from Sarah uh, Anderson. And then Kate Harmon said to want the best outcome for anyone you're working with and to trust that they are capable. And I feel like those two things kind of tie in together with the positive intent. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Well, I want to thank people for sharing in the chat and, you know, the answers that you share, th this is the wisdom, right? This is the wisdom of the group. I have the privilege of sharing my answers to many of these questions, but my answers are not any better and in many cases are not as good as the ones that you're hearing from your, your fellow colleagues. So I, I want to thank people for putting your answers in the chat. I want to encourage you to keep doing that, right, as we charge forward here. If you didn't have time yet to enter your answer to one of these two questions, please do that so that your peers and your colleagues can, can see it. Matt, Tracy, I'm going to charge forward into the next element. So leadership, this business of the choices that we make about what we think, what we say, what we spread to others, they, they occur in multiple domains. Uh, the four principal domains that I've studied are the domain of intent, the domain of roles, the domain of being, which includes energy. And that's what we're going to talk about next, this domain of being and energy. And then the domain of language, which is going to be the next uh, the next one after after this. Um, and the reality, you can see it on this slide. We can choose the energy that we project and we can call for a certain kind of energy among others. That's at the heart of leading in this domain of being and energy. In the absence of these things, think about it. The default, the default is whatever our mood is and whatever the mood of other people who are in the room or in the interaction with us. And we don't have to default to the mood. Like we can be conscious and intentional about the energy that we project. And I'm gonna just share a few quick slides and thoughts about what that looks like in practice. So these are examples of energy choices that we make. And oftentimes we're not conscious about them. Like something happens, particularly when something bad or that we've labeled as bad happens, we can become frustrated with the problems. Now, another alternative is you go through life expecting challenges so that when these things crop up, they're not a surprise. Like it's kind of, hey, this is what happens. And that's why I'm here. Right. If you have a job without frustrations, you don't really have a job. Um, Malcolm Forbes said that uh, many years ago. 
we can focus on what we can't do or what we don't have or what we don't like or why things are happening to us. Now, the flip side of that, you see on, on the other side of the slide, we, we also can choose consciously to focus on what we can do, what we do have, what we do like. And instead of why is this happening to me? Ask a different question. Why is this happening for me? That question makes all the difference in the world. And when these bad things come and they come every day, right? Um, learning to ask that question with system and method has had a huge impact on my life. Um, I had the great blessing when I was at the Environmental Protection Agency of working for a man named Steve Page. Um, I was the section chief. He was my branch chief at the time, many, many years ago. He went on to lead the, the um, Office of um, Air Quality Planning and Standards, the entire EPA operation at Research Triangle Park, uh, almost a thousand people responsible for regulating um, air pollution in the United States. He's an extraordinary manager and he used to say to me, Dennis, your job is to turn chicken shit into chicken salad. And I, I remember the first time he said that, I'm like, what? What are you talking about? He says, bad things come. You got to learn to, to turn those into good things for yourself and others. And this slide is just an example of what that looks like. This is another slide of what it looks like at the individual level, right? Like things happen to us, right? In the grocery store, in emails we get, in meetings that we're in, in Zoom events, um, in traffic. And as those events or encounters occur, um, we can choose to look at them in a positive way or a negative way, even if it's a traffic jam, right? Like, hey, it's an opportunity to think, right? It's an opportunity to change the radio station. You know, there are all, all sorts of things that you get to call someone if you're stalled, right? Like maybe call your mom. That's one of the things I often do when I get stalled in traffic. So it's making this choice on the positive side with energy. In groups, it looks like this. If you ask a group of people to be a certain way or to share a certain energy for a meeting, Sometimes it's a critical analysis energy. Sometimes it's a building on each other energy. But if you're intentional and conscious about it and you have the courage to ask people to join with you, you can create meetings that look like this, where people say more positive things than negative things. You can invite people to do that deliberately. Um, it, and it makes all the difference in the world. But it does require leadership and it requires choice in this domain of energy. And so just a simple request, um, we need to kind of model what we're talking about here, right? I am inviting you as part of this session and in our shared work together going forward with the Rural Resource Center, with each other, to join with me and with each other to generate net forward energy in this session and in our shared work as we go forward in, in, in life. But getting command of your own energy and then inviting others to join with you in a certain kind of energy, it's, 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 it's what this choice is all about. This is one of my colleagues at CMS. He's still at CMS. He's the Chief Medical Officer for Quality Improvement at CMS. His name is Paul McGann. He's a geriatrician, a medical doctor, and an amazing person. And when he learned about some of these methods of managing being and, and, and energy, and he's a scientist. He has two, two master's degrees from MIT before he went on to get his medical degree, right? He started playing with this, and this is the question he generated that I swear to God, we use this five times a day at CMS in our work. Something will happen, usually something bad, and we'll ask Paul's question, what's good about this seemingly bad situation? And it makes all the difference. I remember one day I was in a meeting with Paul and five of our staff, and we're working on the 12th scope of work for the QIO program. So a $2 billion investment, huge contracting enterprise. Uh, it takes about a year to actually do the contracting in the federal government because we're making big awards for very large sums of money. And we had this wonderful person in our office of acquisition and grants management who was our contracting officer, had an extraordinary relationship. She was innovative. She was collaborative. She teamed with us. Everything you would want in a, in a contracting officer. And we're in this meeting and Tracy Archibald, one of my division directors says, Dennis, I just got the worst text message in the world. I'm like, really? She said, we've got to discuss it. I'm like, well, what's it say? I said, well, Linda is leaving our unit at OAGM and she's not going to be our contracting officer anymore. And we were like two months into a 12 month procurement and she was at the, the center of it. She was the heart of it. And we're like, oh, my God. And the whole room, like the energy just crashed. Like, we're like, oh, my God, what's going to happen if we don't have Linda? And Paul says, well, we need to use the question. And everybody's like, screw the question, you know. And that's a lesson, by the way. You need this question the most when you think it won't work. 
when you think the situation is just too bad and it would be impractical or ridiculous to try to use this question. So Paul forced us to use it. And it took us a while to develop an answer. But Tracy, she came up, my division director, who worked with Linda most closely, she came up with the first answer. She said, well, you know, she's getting promoted. That's why she's leaving. She's going to become a division director in a different division. We're like, you know, that's a good thing. That's that's a good thing about this seemingly bad situation. Somebody else said, well, you know, her boss is going to have to lean in, you know, the group director. And she's got a lot more influence, actually, the group director. And she will have to lean in because they're not going to be able to immediately replace Linda. We can cultivate her boss to be the kind of leader that we need in OAGM. And she's got even more influence. That was a great answer to this question. And we did it, by the way. And there were three other answers that followed it. This is a very powerful way to flip your energy and the energy of teams that you're in, particularly when difficult things happen. This is sort of a recipe for turning chicken shit into chicken salad, just for instance, right? That's that's what this looks like. So we're going to pause again, and I'm going to share these two questions. I'd like you, again, if you're with someone, discuss it quickly. If you're not with someone, make a note and then share an answer. Could be a phrase, could be a sentence, could be a paragraph if you have time in the chat. Um, and we're going to turn to Tracy and turn to um, Matt and see if they have some answers from people that have already checked in on this or who are um, doing it live now. Tracy? Yeah, you? thanks, Dennis. So I have two responses to the first question about what resonates with you about more consciously leading in the domain of energy. So we talked to Michelle Mills, who is the CEO for the Colorado Rural Health Center. And Michelle said, leading with energy allows her to focus on opportunities and innovations. And through that focus on opportunities and innovations, others are able to see possibilities and get excited about meeting their mission. And that's a nonprofit um, flex program, which is a unique facet. And then I talked to Terry Hill, who is the senior advisor for rural health leadership and policy at our organization, the, the founding father of our organization and one of my mentors. And Terry said that as leaders, we have a choice of the stories we tell ourselves and share with others. Some stories drain our team of energy and provide excuses for poor outcomes, and others can motivate that same team in a more positive, productive direction. Similarly, we can assess our rural hospitals and communities with an asset-based focus, or we can see the needs and problems with every analysis. Uh, in Terry's opinion, too much time and energy is focused negatively on what we don't have in rural America, yep. rather than counting the many advantages and assets that we do enjoy. And if we assess ourselves and our communities as victims in the ultimate of negative energy, um, then it's usually counterproductive to your point, Dennis. And on the other hand, motivating our teams and rural citizens to positively address our challenges moves us forward and provides important opportunities for growth and accomplishment. Beautiful. You know, I hope I have a chance to meet this, Terry. <laughs> I, I love that answer. And, you know, I just got to say, you know, about these stories that we tell. Uh, I was in Billings, Montana about four weeks ago. Uh, with a group of frontier rural hospital executives and we had this session with um staff from the elected representatives offices in montana right and they were basically as you would expect these hospital leaders were sharing all these bad things and all these things that they needed the their legislators in washington to do different right which is appropriate like that's kind of you know what you have sessions like that for but immediately after that this woman got up who was one of the presenters and she said, man, I wish I was a rural hospital CEO. There are so many opportunities for you guys around payment and around billing and around maximizing your opportunities that you have that are special and are unique to rural America. And then she proceeded to give this presentation on payment and billing, which is a pretty dry subject, right? Yeah. It was extraordinary, right? But she led with the story of how amazing their opportunities were. And it's kind of, you know, it's sort of what Terry was talking about in, in, in the answer you shared. Yeah, we had a few, um, and you would love Terry, by the way. Everyone loves Terry. <clears throat> and, um, yeah, we had a few comments that all kind of hit on the same thing. Uh, first of all, Sarah from Arquita mentioned that she loves the Paul McCann uh, quote, uh, question, and she'll, she'll make sure she post, it, post notes it and uh, keeps up with it. Uh, but a lot of people said stuff about maintaining more quiet time without noise and constant input. And I think a lot of these are coming from the what part of their life or work needs to be more deliberate in leadership. Setting boundaries for myself and respecting other people's boundaries as well. Mm -hmm. um, Becky Royer said, schedule time to focus on priorities and turn off alerts and not schedule meetings. Includes turning off an email. 
Um, and so these are all hitting on the, the same thing. Um, I need to set aside time that is just for me in order to pause and not just react. Um, yeah, and uh, Sarah added that another thing that she has on her desk is a question that she says, how important is it? Um, to just kind of remind her, it's just a post-it note that just kind of reminds her to, to reflect on the importance of what she's doing. And so I think a lot of these, uh, Dennis, hit on this idea of taking a step back Yes. to be good yourself so you can be the best for other people. Yeah. Yeah, I love that. I love that. That's great. Thank you. Uh, and I've heard Sarah's name come up a couple times here. So I just want to call that out um, and thank her for being so active in the chat. Right. Um, uh, now I heard other names as well, but uh, th that's really good. Uh, so thanks to everyone that's doing that. And thank you, Matt. I'm going to go ahead and charge forward into our next segment, which is all about leading in this domain of language. And I'm going to introduce a term that is not very common, uh, speech acts. Uh, I remember when I first heard this term about 20 years ago, I was like, what in the world is a speech act? You know, like, like it just seemed odd to me. Um, but the, the reality is that all leadership happens through language. Think about that for a moment. Like all leadership happens through language. So what we say is really, really important, right? And I realized like I've never really had like coursework or training or instruction in say the language of leadership but it makes all the difference in the world. You know, I grew up in rural Montana and I can remember um, hot days in the summer when we'd go out and fix fence and we spent all day fixing fence, which didn't involve any language or any leadership, right? But when I think of my work now, all day long, I'm using language and I'm using it around leadership choices that I'm making. And you see on the slide, it's a certain way of speaking and listening to get people in action towards the future that we stand for, that our organizations stand for, that we're seeking. This is an interesting concept too, that language can be action. I remember the first time I learned that, like speech that is in action, like how could that be? Like speech is speech, language is language, it's not action, you know, action is something else. Or speech that puts others in action. I remember puzzling over this idea, but I don't want you to puzzle too long, I'll share with you some examples. So I pronounce you man and wife, I think about that. That is a declaration that someone makes that the marriage is formed at, in that moment. You're married and you, you weren't before and you are afterwards, right? Like it's speech that is action or a commitment. I'll deliver the report by next Friday or fire. We need to clear out of here, right? Or let's have dinner together on Friday. Or in this case, I got a call from Sally Buck several months ago and said, would you join us for this reverse site visit in July? So someone makes a request and then you respond to it and you create the future in that moment. And voila, you know, here I am. I'm part of the re reverse site visit in July because Sally Buck reached out with a request. Um, so speech is can be action generating. And as leaders, we need to pay a lot of attention to action. Like that's how the world turns. That's how we make things happen. That's how we make bad things into good things is through action. So understanding that is key. So here is a set of leadership speech acts. And these speech acts, generally speaking, will move you forward. And a lot of them have action elements to them, not all of them. Um, requests, offers, commitments, effective questions, assertions, declarations, flipping negative energy, yes and. These are all leadership speech acts. Like when President Kennedy in 1961 said, we're going to put a man on the moon and return him safely to Earth before this decade is out. That is a leadership declaration. That's a declaration, which is different than an assertion. An assertion is something like hospitals over the period 2010 through 2017 got safer every single year in the United States. And you can back an assertion up with evidence, but they're incredibly powerful, used effectively by leaders. You can do amazing things with these speech acts that move you forward. Now, there's another set of speech acts that generally, not always, but generally move you backwards. So when you're mastering the language of leadership, I would say that this slide, like if you're going to print one slide from this deck and put it, you know, on the wall of your office, I would print this slide because these are the leadership speech acts that generally move us backwards. Complaints, gossip, insults, worries and frets, ineffective questions, excuses, blame. When we use these things, when we say these things, it generally moves ourselves and others backwards. Sort of like the opposite of the leadership stories or the positive stories that Terry was describing in, in his answer to our prior question. So getting command of these things, I'll just say is difficult. 
like I learned about this 20 years ago and I've been working to strip these things out of my language ever since. And I fail every single day, but I'm a lot better at it today than I was 20 years ago because I got conscious about it and I got intentional and I try. So gaining mastery of those first speech acts is really, really powerful. Gaining kind of a commitment and awareness to not use these, I think is even more powerful. Now, we're going to drill down deep on two of the speech acts, requests and offers, these action generating speech acts that are the key to generating abundance, which is the third element that we want to talk about here this afternoon. How do we generate abundance? Now, the thing about requests and offers is they're not neutral. Like if you make a request or an offer, you know, somebody's got to respond to that, right? They either, you know, they have to accept it and then you've got a commitment, you've got a deal and you're in action or say, no, no, um, no, I'm not going to be part of the reverse site visit. You know, I'm busy that day, whatever. Right. So no is totally legit or maybe a counter request or a counter offer. Um, these are the things that happen when you use requests and offers with system and method. They're important because if you're trying to generate resources or unlock resources, unlock abundance in the world, you need to be in action with requests and offers. Briefing people and sharing information doesn't cut it. You've got to take the next step. You've got to have the request or the offer to generate the actions, right? So they're very, very important speech acts. Now, I'm going to share with you how important these speech acts can be with a single story that starts with the woman, an amazing woman named Sue Dillon that you see pictured here on this slide. I met Sue Dillon in 2004 and I'll never forget. It. it was one of the most impactful days of my life. She is a special education teacher from uh, suburbs, uh, suburban area, rural suburban area around Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. And she was working late one afternoon tutoring students um, after school and she got a call from the hospital. They said she needed to come immediately, something with her son. She, of course, jumped in her car, raced to the hospital. And when she got there, she was met at the front door by a social worker. And she knew it's not, that's not good. When a social worker meets you at the front door of the hospital, you know, something bad is happening here. And she learned that her son, Michael Dillon, is 14 years old, kind of a rambunctious, athletic, caring, uh, very active young man had gone climbing after school and he fell from a great height and suffered a traumatic brain injury. Over the course of the next three days, Susan, Michael's stepfather, Michael's father and Michael's sister learned that he would never regain consciousness. He would never eat on his own. He would require a feeding tube. He would never be able to breathe without a ventilator. And as the medical reality descended on their family and they learned their options, they realized that and they made a decision to remove life support and allow Michael to undergo natural circulatory death, which was certain. They made that decision as a family, which is the most difficult decision I can possibly imagine. I have three children of my own. And when I think about it, it's just like, oh my God, you know, this is terrible. And then Susan said, Michael would want, would have wanted to be an organ donor. He, he needs to be an organ donor. And the hospital said, oh, that's not possible. And she's like, what do you mean? He's healthy, he's 14 years old, you know, except for his brain injuries in perfect shape. He, you know, the, the organs he has could, they, they could allow another mother our father's child to go home from the hospital. Michael's not going to go home, but th there's other plates, there's other children who could go home. Hospital said, well, it's a special kind of organ donation that we've never done it here. I don't think they've even done it in the area and we, we can't do it. She said, you need to figure out how to do this. Other parents, children could live, figure it out. That was her request. <laughs> And to the credit of the hospital, they called the Organ Procurement Organization in Philadelphia, the Gift of Life Donor Program, and they sent a team down. They said, well, this is a different situation than normally occurs with um, naturally brain dead donation. Michael's case is what's called donation after circulatory death. And they said, there's really only two places in the country in Massachusetts and Wisconsin where they do this. And Susan said, figure out how they do it there and do it here. And they did. They figured it out. It took them several days. They had to clear new policies to the hospital. The CMO have to sign off on it. Their ethics committee had to sign off on it. 
and Michael became an organ donor. And what Susan expected from her request occurred. Five people got the gift of life from Michael. His corneas, both of them, his kidneys, both of them, and his liver were all transplanted and saved or enhanced the lives of five people, which is what Susan expected. She expected other mother's children to go home. And some did because of Michael and because of what she did. But there were a lot of things that she didn't expect. And that's how abundance works. When you make requests and offers, a lot of the times the things that you're making requests and offers about, in this case, organ donation, with a very clear line of sight on what Sue expected happen. But you also often get bonuses that you don't expect. And I'm gonna share with you a little bit about the bonus, the abundance. So Howard Nathan, you see pictured on the left, he was the CEO of that organ procurement organization. And he made a decision that if we could do it in the suburban hospital here outside of Philadelphia, we should be doing it all throughout his service area, which included Eastern Pennsylvania, New Jersey, and parts of New Jersey and all of Delaware. And he implemented the DCD protocol, it's called Donation After Circulatory Death in all those hospitals. The picture on the right is Santos, who got Michael's liver and it saved Santos' life. And you see Sue Dillon, you see the coordinator from the Gift of Life donor program that went to the hospital and worked all these things out with the medical team there. And you see Avi Shaked on the far right, the transplant surgeon who transplanted Michael's liver into Santos. When Santos learned the story of what happened, he said, you got to meet my mom because I got to go home. And Santos was from Puerto Rico. And he arranged for Sue Dillon to fly to Puerto Rico and meet his mom, which is amazing. Not something she expected. Both Sue and her husband went to Puerto Rico and met Santos' mom and his two sons, whose father's life was saved by Michael's gift of life and Susan's request. These were things she didn't expect. Now, at the time, or several years later, actually, fast forward from, from when this occurred, to 2004, I was leading a national effort to use quality improvement to increase organ donation nationally. I showed you a slide of that earlier, right? We called Howard Nathan and asked him to present in front of all 58 of the nation's organ procurement organizations and 136 teams from the nation's largest trauma centers about how to do donation after circulatory death. So we're spreading best practices. And Howard brought Sue with him. And that's when I met Sue. And Sue gave a seven minute speech before about a thousand people in Dallas, Texas. And she told him about Michael and she told him about her experience and she told him about Santos. And then she said, and I, you have it on the slide here. In my classroom as a special education teacher, the words I can't and I won't are not allowed. And I expect no less from each of you. And those thousand people stood up and they applauded her and they went back home two days later and they implemented DCD policies in their hospitals and it made a huge difference. And this is the kind of difference it made. She gave that speech in January of 2003. And in 2004, there was a 46% increase in DCDD donors in the United States. The next year, there was another 44% increase in donation after circulatory death. And practically every OPO in the country had done at least one, which was key. It was key to these results. Today, more than 20% of all donors, organ donors, deceased organ donors in the United States come from donation after circulatory death. There were 3,124 DCD donors in 2020 that led to over 9,000 transplants. Tens of thousands of moms and dads have been able to take their children home or children have been able to take their moms and dads home because of donation after circulatory death. And a lot of people besides Sue Dillon were involved in these numbers, make no mistake. But the requests and offers that she made were so important to catalyzing this. I, I can't tell you how important it was to, to causing this national change. This is what abundance looks like out of tragedy. Now, here's just a small personal example. When I was, uh, I, I got to know Tom Morris when I worked at HRSA on organ donation and other things. And when I moved to CMS, Tom would frequently call me to represent CMS in forums like the one we're in right now today, right? And I kind of became the go-to person for Tom Morris and the Federal Office of Rural Health Policy at CMS. And I did everything I could to assist HRSA and rural providers in my senior executive role there. Um, that's led in some ways to the introduction to Sally Buck and the work that I'm doing with you here today, joyous work. This is how abundance happens. Requests and offers occur. They generate in many cases what we expect, but in many cases they're spillover long-term abundance effects that we can't possibly predict or imagine, but they happen. 
and gaining mastery of using requests and offers with system and method as leaders, making that choice is the key to unlocking abundance. Now, I want to ask you to process this. We're going to do this real quick, and then I'm going to wrap up uh, in the four minutes or so after we finish this next segment. So, Tracy, um, I'm going to turn to you again, and I'm hoping you'll have an answer or two to the question. What is a request or an offer that had a big impact on your work or life? And I want to invite those of you participating to go to the chat and share your answer. Like, I'll just give you a quick, easy one for me. <laughs> 38 years ago, I made a request to Diane Hill that she marry me. And it was the best request I, I've made in my entire life, right? Like, that's for me, like, that's my, my easy one. But there are many, many others, all right? So share an important request or offer. Or what are your insights about using requests and offers with greater system and method in your own work? What are the requests and offers that you need to make and who do you need to make them to? Like, this is a question I try to ask myself before every meeting because I, I want the meetings to result in meaningful action, you know, forward motion, good things in the world, right? So, I'm, Tracy, I'm going to turn to you and see if you've got something you can share with a larger group. I sure do. Yep. So, uh, a couple of answers to the first question about a request or offer that had a big impact in your work or life. Um, Kate Harmon is the program manager in, up in Alaska for the FLEX program. And she noted that requesting an internship and help and to start her master's of public health classes before she was fully accepted into the MPH program made a big difference to her. It a, went a long way towards helping her to develop relationships with program professors, and she thinks it secured her eventual acceptance. And then another from Jack King, who is the director of the Montana Flex program with the Montana Hospital Association. And Jack said he was in his early 40s and recently married for the first time and a new father, and he was owning and operating a restaurant, tavern, in downtown Great Falls, Montana. And he was approached one afternoon by a friend who was already on the board and the CEO of one of the two faith-based hospitals in town. And the offer was that they invited him to join the board of Columbus Hospital. And despite his intense efforts, he said to talk them out of it, he accepted. And he said he's been in healthcare ever since in one form or another, and he's grateful for that invite every single day. Beautiful. You know, I, I just have to share, um, I had the good fortune four weeks ago to meet Jack King when I was speaking at a healthcare conference in Billings, Montana. Um, and I'm so glad, you know, many of the people on this call probably know Jack King, but he's just an extraordinary human being. And I want to thank him, especially for sharing that answer about the request that someone else made to him that changed his career tra trajectory. Like that's really, that's really something. Matt, do we have anything in the chat that you can share? We do. Oh. Um, Lisa Davis had said, will you take this job as a requester and offer? And I think that really resonates with a lot of people. Or Leslie Howe said, "How will you, will you help me do this? Um, that can be humbling a lot of times. Um, Lisa added that taking on new opportunities where I really don't have the skills and need to stretch. Um, that's always a, a good one, too. Yeah. Um, Lisa um, Cracker, again from Utah, or at least at Liz Cracker from Utah, uh, an offer to choose to get involved in public health after cancer. She is now 25 years cancer free. Uh, and so that is um, a positive thing, too. It looks like all these people were just met with opportunities that maybe they didn't expect, took a jump off the diving board and just wanted to see where life would take them, put some miles on their soul and are now reaping the rewards, and I'm sure other people are reaping the rewards as well. And also, just so you know, Jack said the pleasure was his. <laughs> Very good. <laughs> so thank you, Tracy. Thank you, Matt. Um, all the people that responded. I think Liz, I think I heard Liz before as well, too. So um, from Utah, um, a lot in here about these requests that others made that, that impacted their life and their careers, or, you know, like you said, Matt, sort of taking the plunge, you know, jumping. Um, and it shows the power of requests and offers. We all have that power, right? All of us can do this with greater system and method. And that is the key to unlocking abundance. Now, I've got maybe four more slides and we're going to wrap up here. So I'm going to charge forward again. And this is about real work. So in 1992, I was invited to a breakfast seminar in downtown Washington, D.C. I was a fellow in the Council for Excellence in Government. And they had a speaker for a breakfast event, and they invited maybe 30 of us to come listen to this fellow. 
His name was Robert Kohler. And he had served for the prior three years as the executive vice president of TRW Corporation, which I'd never heard of, but I learned was a very large defense contractor that was on the verge of bankruptcy. They hired Bob Kohler from his federal job. He was the associate director of the Central Intelligence Agency for hardware. Like he and his team designed, launched, and managed the nation's spy satellites. So kind of an engineering hardware um, national security sort of a function, very senior executive at CIA. And he went to TRW and he shared with our group of fellows that he implemented the model that he has used success successfully throughout his career of focusing the teams and the organizations that he leads on three things, making commitments, delivering on the commitments we make and securing commitments from others. Kohler asserted that that's why he was able to turn around TRW to take them from the verge of bankruptcy to becoming a very profitable defense contractor in a matter of three years. He also shared that this model was the model he used throughout his entire federal career in rising through the ranks at the Central Intelligence Agency. And he says, if you actually keep track of your time, you'll discover most of your time, you're not doing these three things. You're doing something else. I was like, really? Hmm. Because I sort of viewed myself as somebody who did a lot, did these three things all the time. He said, actually, if you chart your behavior, you'll learn that you spend most of your time talking about commitments, but not doing these three things. And I was like, really? He said, now you need to talk about commitments. That's not a bad thing. But then you need to make commitments, right? Talk is important, but not sufficient. Like you've got to take the action steps. I went back and shared this model with my staff. And boy, did they get good at securing commitments from me right? Like that was one of the outcomes, but it's a powerful model. This is the other slide that I would say, print it, put it on your, on your office wall, because this is the key to making the world turn. Imagine if you're in front of a group of a thousand people and you ask them all to make a particular commitment and half of them do it, like, my God, that's 500 commitments. That's how the world turns, right? So I'm about to ask you to make a couple of commitments. Um, no surprise, right? Like I've been talking here for 55 minutes or so. Um, I'm going to turn now and I, I am going to ask you to do something right? Now, it'll be fun and it's easy, but it can make a huge impact, right? So um, I learned in country school, I went to the Fertile Prairie Country School, grades K through eight. Uh, you see here, this is when I was in seventh grade. I'm in the back row in the red shirt, all right? Um, I was in seventh grade at the time. This was our country school, all of us. Um, and in country school, the way it works is the second graders drill the first graders. You give the first graders their spelling test. You listen to them when they read, you know, in, in the reading textbooks and so on. The third graders drill the, the second graders and so on up the line. That's kind of how it works. And what I discovered gradually over time is that we really learn by teaching. Like it's really important. Like if we can take content that we just learned and turn around and somehow spread it or teach it to others, it's very, very powerful. So I'm going to ask you to do that. I'm going to ask you to, to do what I did when I was in country school. So my closing request to you would be to please share one or more of these leadership methods that we've talked about. Real work, abundance, generating abundance through requests and offers, generating a certain kind of energy and sharing it with others, and understanding that leadership is all about choices that we make. I'd invite you to maybe take some of these slides and share them with one other person in the next 24 hours. Ideally, I would say take them back to your team or your staff and share them with your team or your staff, because I know it will help to cement these concepts and make them more useful and portable for you. And it will also extend them to other people. If you're supporting rural healthcare providers, take these slides and use them in your work. You will make their lives better and you will enhance their effectiveness. Um, so that's my request to you. Now, I'd like to invite you if you could put a thumbs up or a yes or something like that in the chat signaling that you're willing to do this, I would be very, very grateful. Um, so please share with another person the next 24 hours, could be your wife, could be your husband, could be a partner, could be a, a son or a daughter, um, a coworker, and then ideally with a group within the next week. Th those are the two requests. And I'm hoping you'll say yes, and I'm hoping you'll do this. These slides will be made available to you to do that. Um, and in closing, I'm just gonna offer a gift. I don't know if you can see, but I'm wearing a, a button. A leadership button. It's a lapel pin and it looks like this, right? Um, so leaders like buttons, we hold things together. And I know that many of you in the flex programs have been holding things together for rural American health providers. 
and I'm grateful for that. It's a leadership activity. There are two other parts of, of buttons as a metaphor for leadership. One is that when we go back to the very earliest excavations of, of humankind, archaeologists find buttons dating all the way back to the beginning. So they've been with mankind, buttons have been with mankind from the beginning, just like leadership. And buttons are ubiquitous. They're in Africa, Asia, North America, Central America, South America. They're all throughout the globe, through Europe. Every culture uses buttons. Like leadership, every culture has leadership. So my offer is if you'd like a button, put it in the chat and um, the folks at the National Rural Resource Center um, will get one out to you. Um, compliments of me. Um, it might take a couple of weeks, but if you're interested in getting the button lapel pin, it's just a closing way to kind of remind you of the importance of leadership in your role as leaders. Um, and hopefully some of the things that we talked about here today. So I'm going to stop there and I'm going to turn this back to my colleagues at the National Rural Health Resource Center. Thank you for being such a great audience. You're actually turning it back to me, um, Dennis, where I, I want to take the opportunity to thank you, number one, for um, your thoughts on leadership and for sharing these incredibly moving stories. And it's always interesting to me how impactful one person's story can be. And I've shared this with other people. We've never promised to see the results of our actions, our positive mm -hmm. leadership, our things that we do. Um, but in these few cases that you shared, the impact was seen and felt by thousands and thousands of people. Um, and that's that's important. And so we appreciate you, Dennis, and uh, we appreciate your time. And we know you got to scoot and get to your next thing. And we wish you well. And we will follow up uh, with these buttons for everyone and um, wish you all the best, Dennis. And at this time, I am going to hand it over to... Uh, Laura and Rachel from the federal office who have uh, been instrumental and in, uh, well, you saw Laura step in at the last minute this morning. And so they are instrumental in the work that we do here on the ground and they will be closing out our session today uh, and closing out the RSV. We want to thank everyone for all their comments, their interactions, their engagements, just being here and being willing to learn. In about one minute, you'll get an email uh, from me asking you to do the post assessment please take a few minutes to get that done and get it sent back to us so I don't have to beg you to do it later. That would be incredibly nice of you um, in this leadership world. That'd be very nice of you. And so without further ado, I will hand it over to Laura and Rachel. Thank you, guys. Thank you so much, Matt. I will kick it to Rachel to get us started if we can get our, our uh, slides up for the screen share. Great. And while we wait for that, um, for those of you who don't know me, um, I'm Rachel Moscato, and I am the Deputy Director in the Hospital State Division. Um, I've been in this role for about two years now, but have attended um, Flex River site visits um, for probably about the past four years, um, as I used to be a project officer working with the state offices of rural health. Um, so, Laura, you can go ahead and click to the next slide. Um, just in our last few minutes together, I kind of wanted to wrap everything up and sort of touch on some of the things we um, talked about during the, the week, um, because really this year's theme of adaptation, equity, and innovation, it just ties really nicely in with all of the priorities that Laura, Talia, and Natalia touched on yesterday, um, that we've heard Tom and Terrell and all of our other speakers talk about um, throughout the week you know, moving towards measurable outcomes, focusing on flex program evaluation activities, building strong collaborations between the states. Um, and, you know, even as we think about the past 25 years of flex, you know, I was listening to Ter Terrell's remarks and I'm like, adaptation and innovation is really what's driven the flex program to where it is today. So as we move through the upcoming grant year, um, our goal as division leadership is to highlight the FLEX program impact in a way that really aligns with four strategic objectives around improved rural health status and quality, expanded rural capacity, improved rural access and sustainability. And really these areas are the core of the work that you do every day. So this framework just really provides an opportunity for us to emphasize just how much the FLEX program really helps FORP achieve its mission. Next slide. So as we think about the overall work that the program has done to improve quality, expand capacity, and improve access to care over the past year, 
Really, your flexibility and adaptation to the changing healthcare landscape has been key to the success that we're seeing, um, particularly as we make this shift moving towards, you know, this focus on outcomes within the FLEX program. You know, and of course, we know that like adaptation <laughs> takes time and is a process. Um, you know, each state is going to be in a different place. And even within each state, all of your hospitals are also in different places. Um, and, you know, then we've got curveballs being thrown at us all the time with COVID constantly changing the way that we work, um, turnover, all of those things. And that just creates the need for further adaptation. So for us, really, the goal is to have a map that's laid out, but understand that this is a journey. So, you know, first we focus on the activities and make sure that we're really doing work that is relevant and needed within um, the rural communities. And then we look at outputs and then we move towards outcomes. And of course, always adding um, adaptations and flexibility where needed. Next slide. So equity is another piece um, that's been highlighted a lot and it's an incredibly important topic now, um, particularly with this administration renewing the focus on this. Um, but we know that this is not a new concept and that those of you who've been doing this for a while, our work has always been rooted in equity, um, you know, because we're aiming to provide access to quality care in, in geographically remote and underserved areas. But this renewed focus is does present a really nice opportunity for us to, you know, build capacity around rural health equity. Um, seeking out new partnerships and connecting with populations of folks who could help broaden our knowledge and further refine our efforts to support hospitals as they work to achieve measurable um, improvements in the health outcomes in their communities. Next slide. And then, of course, innovation is really what drives all this forward. Um, you know, I think hearing... Um, Natalia and, and Laura talk about the, the QI projects. That's just been such a great example of innovation. Um, you know, for us, we look at these projects, you know, as a pilot within one area. Um, but now that we've seen how they've really helped support you as flex program coordinators, um, we're looking at how we can apply this more broadly, you know, within quality improvement, but within other program areas as well. Um, and then just one final thought that I have is that none of this happens without the support of our FLEX partners. Um, TASC, the FLEX monitoring team, and the team at Stratus Health. Um, honestly, you know, when I think about adaptation, the, the tools and the resources that all of you have also provided um, is just has been, you know, key to helping the states do their work. Um, and also, you know, want to acknowledge that you have had to adapt um, the way that you are working as well, um, just because of all of the changes that we've experienced this year and really in the past two years. Um, so thank you all. Thank you to our partners, um, to the states. Thank you all for all you do. Um, and now I'll turn it over to Laura, who will share some reflections on the past three days. Thank you so much, Rachel. Um, I don't know that I can say anything better but I will say the past three days have just, I don't know if anybody else feels this way, but when I go to a training or a conference or something, a meeting like this one that we've just had, it gives me so much new energy to keep going and doing new things. And what we've seen, I mean, day one, we had our flex, uh, future flex presentation from the flex monitoring team, but day two, we had our core competencies update. But on top of that, sprinkled throughout all three of these days, the amount of really wonderful things that all of you are doing at the state level, all of our EMS supplement grantees um, and recipients who are doing such great, great activities, highlighting our quality innovation labs. We've got, you know, we have presentations on partnerships and swing beds and the future of quality reporting and population health and outcome measures and how COVID has affected all of these things. And it just, it makes me very proud to work with all of you. And um, you can see that like Rachel just said, not only do we have our great federal partners uh, working with us, but you all as well are partners in this exactly at, at the state level, exactly as they are. And we take all of your suggestions as best we can. And we want to listen to everything that you have to say. So please use this time or use the future, the next few weeks to network with your fellow states. If you heard something in a presentation that you want to implement in your own state, reach out, send them an email and they'll happily share any information they can. You can reach out to task and they can put you in touch with someone or to us at the federal office. And we can kind of connect you in the ways that we can. Um, and we're getting ready for our next competitive cycle. So just keep an eye out on your emails. We're going to have some fun things coming out, some new webinars coming up soon. Um, and with that, we are closing our reverse site visit. So as my 
at the end of my first reverse site visit as your flex program coordinator. Thank you all so much for all of your engagement over the past few days. Um, one quick reminder, I'll echo what Matt just said to complete the electronic assessment that will be coming to your email. Uh, TAS will also be distributing information for how you can access all of the recorded sessions that you might have missed. Um, and a last thank you to all of our speakers, especially our state flex programs, uh, to the conference planning committee who put all of this together. Thank you so very much. And um, to the attendees, to all of you, our state flex coordinators, our SOAR directors, our contractors, thank you so much for all of your hard work and dedication to the flex program. We could not do any of this without you. And with that, we will say good day.